All right, hey everyone, welcome to the, the Tilt Together page for a Facebook Live with my dear friend Seth Perler. If you are watching this, um, I'm already seeing some likes, so we know you're there, thank you. Just take a minute, there's a little bit of a lag. Um, take a minute and just maybe share where you are watching this from. And also, I'd love to hear in one word, what kind of sums up your mood <laughs> or the energy in your house right now? Um, I'm, I just want to kind of know where you all are at. So just take a minute to do that. And, uh, and Seth and I, are, I'm going to spend a few minutes just introducing it to you and let people jump on. And my word, Seth, I want to know your word. My word right now is, is actually focused for some reason. I'm feeling pretty focused at the moment. What's your word? For today or for lately? Yeah, for today. <sighs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh. Um, my word for today... <laughs> is hopeful. Oh, that is a good word. All right, that's a good word. All right, we've got flustered in Texas. We've got simplified. Oh, I love that. Um, good but high anxiety, keeping the days off. Um, yeah, Chesapeake, Chesapeake, Virginia. Houston, peaceful, very nice. Hailing from my living room in central Minnesota. We've got Calgary, Canada. Fantastic. Awesome. Um, overwhelmed. Ooh, we've got Oslo, Norway. Fantastic. Well. Welcome, all you guys. Calmly overwhelmed. Very nice. I can relate to that. Uh, is a stir crazy one word. It certainly mm -hmm. can be. Yeah. Uh, rooted. These are some really reflective. These are some really positive words. I'm, this is making me feel grounded actually reading all these words. So thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to just take a few minutes. I want to get right into the meat of this because I know people are juggling on many things right now. Um, I wanted to take a minute to introduce Seth. Um, Debbie, how can I, how can I see this live? Sorry to interrupt everybody, but I can't find it. Like I found the event. So if you can no, just go to Tilt Together page, and if you refresh it, it should show up in the stream. Got it. I see it. Well, I see uh, something. Because I know people are juggling on many things right now. Um, I okay. wanted to take a minute to introduce yeah. Seth. Um, Debbie, how can, I, how can I see this live? Can you mute your computer? <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to look at it. I can't see the comments. It's okay. fine. They scroll by pretty quickly, so I'm going to okay. kind of monitor that you don't worry about that you just kind of I'm closing it up. I'm just going to be okay. here hi everybody nice. so uh for those of you in my tilt community who are not uh familiar with Seth Seth Perler is an executive functioning coach he has a, an incredible resource website called sethperler.com he ran the executive functioning online summit last year which was a phenomenal week-long event he's got a very active YouTube channel he makes a lot of videos, both for parents and kids alike, about all things executive functioning. He used to be a teacher. He lives, breathes, and eats this stuff, and he's incredibly passionate about this work. So if you aren't familiar with Seth, he's also a frequent guest on the podcast, um, but check out his website at sethperler.com. He has um, Sunday updates he sends out. He has a student success toolkit and you just created a special resource for parents right now. Yeah, I just made something on my website. If you go to sethperler.com, can somebody type it in the chat, sethperler.com, because I can't get to the regular chat on Facebook. But at the top of it, I put COVID-19 parent and teacher help or something, and then that'll lead you to a resource page. Um, where I'm just making content, sort of what Debbie and I will be talking about today, because what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks and months is everything is going to get shook up like a jar of mud in terms of your kid's education. So my question is, and I'm assuming Debbie's question as well for people is, how do we uh, navigate what the schools are going to be telling us? And how do we also take care of ourselves and make sure that our kids are getting as many phenomenal or 
high value educational experiences that they need for their future, regardless of what's going on with the schools. So that's what's going on in my, in my head. So good. Okay, awesome. Yes, thank you for Valerie for posting the link and um, we'll add a resource page for this too for I'll try to compile anything that comes up in the chats at another time. And then quickly just to introduce myself because I know Seth put a blast out to his list last night and there's a lot of new members in this page. So if you're not familiar with me, my name's Debbie Reber. Uh, my community is called Tilt Parenting. I run the Tilt Parenting Podcast, which I just released episode 201 today, and we're almost at 2 million downloads. So I've been doing this for four years. It's a resource for parents who are raising what I call differently wired kids. And I just wanted to clarify what that is, because I know some of you may have joined and been like, well, I don't know if my kid's differently wired. That's a term I use to describe anyone who has any sort of neurodevelopmental difference. So there may not be any sort of diagnosis like ADHD or dyslexia or um, autism or being gifted, you know, twice exceptional. It may just be a kid who has executive functioning challenges or some processing speed issues or some sensory issues. So it's a big bucket that I use as a way to capture kids who need some extra support or have some lagging skills in some areas. So that's what I do. And if you want to check out my website, it's tiltparenting.com. There's a lot of resources there, including a new tilt education section, which now includes the most comprehensive list of schools that support differently wired learners in the world. There's a, almost 200 schools on there with um, feedback from parents. So that's me. Now to just say something about that, Debbie, for those of you who are watching is my favorite podcaster and one of my favorite people. And um, her style is so like, she's a fantastic interviewer and she really brings these amazing people on and really pulls out of the really valuable information for understanding your kids. So she is amazing. I do not just say that she is my, if I, I'm not supposed to pick favorites, she's my favorite though. <laughs> she's, she's yeah. amazing and she brings a lot to the world of families so thank you yeah. i knew there was a reason i invited you to do this <laughs> that's the truth <laughs> so thank you um we like working together if it's not obvious we we're really happy we found each other through this work and um we like to share um and create together so I wanted to pose just a question to Seth and share my thoughts on something. And then I know many of you have shared some questions. I've gone through those. I think the themes we're going to talk about are kind of universal in terms of what we're experiencing right now. Um, but I wanted to pose the question to Seth and then I'll answer it as well. Um, first, that what do you think in this moment, so we're in week two, three, depending on where you're living up this kind of strange new reality of our kids at home and in many states being kind of really confined uh, to our spaces. What should the priorities be for our kids right now? Like what should we be most concerned about or focused on in terms of their reality? Yeah, I, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is relationship. But in this context, the thing that goes with relationship here is the nervous system. So basically, what I always say whenever I start off a talk is that the most important thing, it begins and ends with the relationship. The best teachers your kids will ever have in their entire life, the reason that it's their favorite teacher, if you ask them in 30 years why they liked the teacher, it's really because they may not remember anything the teacher taught them, they remember that the teacher uh, made them feel cared about, made them feel loved, made them feel like they mattered, made them feel like they're important. It's all about the relationship. So with parents too, this is a time for relationship building. That does not mean that there is not conflict, that it's perfect or that it's easy or anything like that. It means that for relationship building, for building healthy and securely attached relating with your child, for building the sort of relationship where when your kid really needs you, they're going to feel emotionally safe enough to come to you and say, hey, mom, dad, I need help. I don't know how to navigate this thing in my life where they feel safe with you. Uh, even if they don't today, you know, we have a lot, and if they're a teenager and they're really, um, 
and just wanting to distance themselves from you, even if you're going through that, it's still about building the relationship. It's about saying to them, hey, I know you may not want to talk right now, but I'm here for you. I love you. I care about you no matter what happens. I'm here for you. I may not do it perfectly, but I am here for you and I will do anything and everything. And you can ask me anything and everything. And I may not respond how you want me to or how even I want to all the time, but I am here for you. So building that relationship is number one. And along with that, with number two is the nervous system. And that what that means is that your child, um, they're, they're not only learning all of this academic and educational, all these educational things in their life right now, but they're also learning how to live in this world. And a lot of learning to live in this world is learning to work with the nervous system. And unfortunately, many of us adults have grown up learning to listen to our thoughts and our bodies and just take it as fact. And let me explain what I mean so that you really understand where I'm coming from. The thoughts is the mind and the story and the narrative. I'll talk about that later. But the body is, is that oftentimes we feel something uncomfortable and our response or our reaction is to change the way we feel. We don't want to feel uncomfortable. And as we all grow up, what we learn is that we have to deal with things. And when we don't deal with things, they get worse. So this is an opportunity with our children. They're going to be dealing with uncomfortable feelings. And our instinct might be to rescue them, to save them, to change it, to ignore it, to forget about it, to push it aside, to say, don't feel that way and those sorts of things. When what we wanna do is help them learn to process and navigate those feelings in healthy ways that are going to be planting seeds to empower them to become adults who know how to work with the uncomfortable feelings and emotions in life so that they can really live to purpose, so that they can really have fantastic, healthy relationships when they're older with, with people who they're working through things, they're not just avoiding them. Um, they, they have secure, healthy, good people around them, and they know how to show up in that sort of a way. So we're dealing with your relationship with your child, but also how do you use this time to help your child explore the uncomfortable anxieties and stresses and things that are going on during this very real time when the whole world is on edge right now. Um, this is history in the making, you know, in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years that people are gonna look back on this and say, remember the pandemic of 2020 and how can we help them through this time uh, as messy as it is to get as much out of it with their nervous systems in terms of working with their nervous system response. Their nervous system is responding to this time in the way that it should. And what I mean by that is that their nervous system is having a sense of, I'm not safe. I'm being threatened. My family's not safe. My friends are not safe. So I don't even know if I have words around this, but I have a sense that something not safe is going on. There is a threat out there, which is the reality of what's going on. So how do we help them navigate those challenging feelings in their nervous system that wants to respond to threat and may not have tools to respond to the threats in a way, in an optimal way? How do we help sort of navigate that? So I guess that's how I would respond there, Debbie. What do you think? Yeah, love it. I totally agree with you. Um, I... I think that relationship piece is key. And um, what I've been talking a lot about within my community, I just did a solo podcast about this yesterday, is how important it is to really prioritize our kids' mental, emotional, and physical health right now. And we will talk about school because um, I know that's what people are most concerned about right now. Um, but this, what we are experiencing is something unprecedented. Like there are no rules for this. There is no normal way of moving through this. And so really thinking about how can I help my child feel secure and safe right now in our home? How can I contribute to an energy of safety and calm um, to help my child's, you know, people have been asking about helping them manage their anxiety. Um, we, we have a lot of power in doing that in the way that we are managing our own anxiety and the way that we're kind of, yeah, creating a, a culture in our, in our home, what we talk about, how we spend our time, um, how obsessively we're checking CNN, uh, you know, just the choices that we're making. So we really do want to focus on that emotional, mental health, making sure we get out for walks and taking care of our bodies. 
And then empathizing um, and acknowledging what a dysregulating time this is. So I love what you said, Seth, about this being an opportunity to really learn how do we deal with hard things? Because even if this wasn't happening, that's a skill every human needs to, that life is hard. We all go through hard things. Um, I think the fact that this is a, this is a time when everyone is going through something is actually, can actually help because if, if, when our kids are going through hard situations, they can often, especially these kids, um, differently wired kids can often think they're the only ones going through this, right? Or I've got it really bad and everyone else has it easier. Or, you know, this is me, me, me. And now it's really everyone. And so that kind of levels the playing field in some ways. And it gets them maybe less defensive about their own uh, situation and more kind of open to, wow, this is something we're all going through and maybe more willing to feel those feelings, to learn what does this feel like in my body, to process in a safe way all the uncomfortableness and the anxiety and fear or concern or other things that might be coming up. So I think just really over empathizing um, and always just acknowledging, yeah, this is really hard. And you might have really good days. And then one day everything's out the window again, and there's anger and frustration and um, sadness or whatever the emotion looks like. And just holding that calm space of, I know this is really hard this really sucks. I get it. I, I totally hear you. And just being that continual source of empathy so they can feel heard, so they feel safe talking about these feelings and so that they can process them. Um, so those are my thoughts on the priority um, for right now. And let me ask you this question before we move on to some of the listener questions. Seth, I'm wondering knowing what we're going through when you just talked about really emotional regulation in some ways, are there other opportunities for executive functioning growth that might be present now that we might not even realize, you know, cause I think when we're in school mode, we're focused on the binders and the homework and the assignments and, you know, all of these skills, right. Time management. Are there some other opportunities in this kind of upside down, uh, place that we're in yeah. that we can seize upon absolutely positively 100 percent. so executive function skills are skills they're things that can be built and developed and they don't happen on their own for kids with strong executive function it seems like they're happening on their own but they're not those kids just they they are naturally better at those things but it's not just happening they are practicing skills and they have practiced skills for years, for the kids who struggle with executive fun function, they have to more consciously um, and more regularly and more, um, what's the, I don't know the word, but they have to more carefully put more effort into developing these skills because if they don't do it, the problem is, is that it will impact their future where they cannot go for the goals and dreams that matter to them when it matters. So if your kid's a junior in high school and they say, oh, I hate school and blah, blah, blah. And one day when they're 23, they decide, oh, they have a big giant career goal and they really want to go for it. And they have no executive function. They're going to really struggle with those things. So executive function is not rocket science. Luckily, it's pretty, um, it's in, in some ways, it's in some ways, it's pretty straightforward. And what I'm going to mention to you now, as far as what I think is the most important executive function consideration right now, um, this is fairly straightforward. So I think that the biggest practical consideration, you know, you and I talked about relationships and emotions and the nervous system and stuff. The biggest practical executive function thing that I think is going on now that you have an opportunity to help your child with executive function, but that also will impact their closeness with you their sense of relationship and security with you and their regulation of their nervous system, even though their words that are coming out of their mouth may reject this idea. The best thing that I think that we can do right now, the most important thing that I think that we can do right now is structure and schedules. That does not mean you have to have a rigid schedule. It does not mean you have to follow the schedule perfectly. 
but it does mean that you have to mindfully, conscientiously, carefully with your child's buy-in and ownership and their thoughts about the structure and the schedule that you need to sit down with them and say, we, this is not a free for all. We need some structure in our life. We're going to bring this, impose this, create it together. How, how are you going to, ideally you're going to create it together, but they need structure and they're the ones who struggle with executive function will sometimes, sometimes they really welcome it, but if it doesn't go along with what they feel like doing, they might really reject it, but they want to know and their nervous systems need to know that that structure is there. Um, it's, it's like um, if you go bowling and you throw a bowling ball down, down, the, uh, down the alley erratically, it will be caught by the gutters and it will safely get to the end. There is a structure there. It's like being in bumper cars. You can bounce into people, but there are bumpers on the cars. There are bumpers around the sides of it. So the people waiting in line don't hurt. There are structures there. It cannot be a free for all. So now executive function has a lot to do with organization and planning. And um, this is planning of time, this structure, this calendaring, this structuring your weeks. I guess to be very practical, Debbie, I would say I want to see people structure out a week, put it on the wall meaning that it says, you know, we wake up at this time, we go to bed at this time, we eat at these times. And there, it doesn't have to be perfect, but what are the general times that you're going to be doing these things? And if you're a parent who doesn't have great executive function, you're going to have to work 50 times as hard to put some of that structure in place. And if you have exceptional executive function, you're going to have to work harder to allow there to be flexibility when it's reasonable. And you all, all have to find that balance, but I would want to see on all of your walls a giant color-coded calendar that says, here are the times we are doing these things, here are free times, here are study times, here are times when we have family time and connection time, here are times when we, when we don't talk about anything heavy at all, what, whatever the things that you choose to put on there. But that is going to be helping with executive function because that's going to, during this time, help them see structures and time, hopefully help them be a part of creating that. Anyhow, I, maybe I've said enough on that already. Well, no, that was super helpful. Um, you just said, hopefully they'll be a part of it. And that's um, someone Valerie said as well, like that collaboration is really critical. And I just want to also say, you said that nervous systems need to know that the structure is there. And this is something that you're probably going to get pushback or you might get a lot of resistance, you know, when you decide, when you say, let's have a meeting to plan our schedule or when you go over the schedule, you might get resistance. And I know for a lot of parents, especially um, now, if you, you don't want to ruffle feathers, right? We just, if things are going well, we don't want to like disrupt that and, and create problems. So, um, but it's okay to get that resistance. That pushback might be just a knee-jerk reaction. That is, but they still need this. They they crave it, even if they're going to potentially react um, in a way. Um, and and yeah. they they will. They're part of their job, especially as adolescents, is to push back on everything you say. I mean, some of them, no matter what you say, you can say no right. It doesn't matter. Yes, say no. Look we're gonna sit down and talk about this and this is an important one. And I wanna hear what you have to say, otherwise I'm gonna be determining the structure. Mm -hmm. Right, and I love to, Seth said he wants to see pictures, so I, I do too. So if you guys do, that, share your pictures, like we can start a Oh, thread. I didn't say that, but I would love to, but I was saying I'm picturing in my mind yeah. in an ideal world, all the families have this, but I would love to see. I took it to the next level. So yeah. if, you, if, you, if you've done this, um, we can start another thread, but I, I would like love to see weekly schedules, how yes. people break down the weekly yes. schedules. So I love that. Um, one thing I would add in addition to structures and schedules, that is an opportunity right now is, um, I also see kind of like those life skills of, um, helping to maintain, you know, um, uh, maybe helping, uh, with some meal prep or some things when, and when we're really busy and we're juggling school and activities and things, um, there may not be as many opportunities, but for many of us, you know, if we're living in small spaces and we are sharing that space more than usual, 
keeping the house clean or working together as a team is even more critical right now. And so th that's another opportunity I see to kind of develop some skills around cleaning and organizing and, and meal prep and laundry and pitching in and, and just kind of being a part of kind of the engine that keeps our, our families running. Yep. And those are planning and organization as well. Meal prep is planning and organization, mm -hmm. learning to cook. And I will tell you, parents, a lot of my college students that I've had have had a lot of what's called learned helplessness, where they have not learned how to cook meals and how to do laundry and how to do basic self-care things because their parents have done it for them their whole life. And this is a good opportunity for them to participate more in those things, but that will help build the executive function around what should be simple things, but for a lot of my college students have really, they've really struggled with. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I share a calendar that I made? Yeah. So I did make one I was gonna put on my website. I'm just not done with it yet, but this is a weekly calendar on Google Docs that I will be putting up eventually. But what I did is I just put, I started on Monday rather than Sunday. Um, and this is just a way, I started at 6 a.m. Obviously it's gonna be different. But this is just kind of some thing, some ways that you can do it. And I, one of the things that I was cautioning against in creating. Now, this depends. Your school may have a very rigid schedule, but if it didn't, I would caution against the idea for people who are highly linear, who think 15 minutes a day on something. For certain things like, um, like I would not want my kids to be doing. 15 minutes a day of math, science, social studies, reading and writing. I would rather see them immersed in math one day or in math and social studies one day or something like that, rather than thinking, let's do these tiny segments. Why? Because I want them, the immersion in the content is what's gonna get them to mastery and to really dive into the content. So it's not just getting things done and getting a little bit of reading done and a little bit of writing done. Um, now, some things that's, I would recommend small segments like that, like daily cleaning. I think you're gonna get a lot more out of your child if you say, hey, let's clean five minutes a day, then let's clean one day a week for 35 minutes. Sure, straightening up. Yeah, we're gonna straighten up as we go, kind of a schedule. <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise, um, things but that's, well. that's the sort of weekly type schedule you might consider I love um, Pascal shared that at four o'clock they have tea, cake, and jokes. I love that. Oh, I like that. We had tea one day last week and I was like, oh yeah, we could be doing tea time every day. Um, and the so positivity with jokes. For sure. Yes, we, uh, just... I shared this in another Facebook Live, but we were watching TV news bloopers last week. It was like a half hour and I was crying. I was laughing so hard. So yeah, anything that can get that release is a nice thing. <laughs> um, okay, I wanna switch to some questions and I love seeing all the chat in the, in the, um, the thread here. This is gonna stay on here. So you can go back and scroll through and see what people have shared and what people are saying. But here's some of the questions from our community. And this first one, I think is the big one that a lot of people are gonna, um, a lot of people are going to be like, yes, that's what's happening here. So what do we do when our kid flat out refuses to do schoolwork? Uh, you know, there are some, it looks different for everyone. And some kids are fully online and doing it independently. Others have to show up for virtual classes. What if a kid's just like, just they're in school refusal mode, but they're doing it at home? This is such a complicated issue. It's very hard for me to address this without knowing the person, the family, and the kid. Um, I often say that you know you can't you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And my job as an executive function coach is to make him drink. And how do you do that? Um, so the first thing that I think we do is I have a thing on my site somewhere called iceberg theory. If you look for iceberg on my site, there's a graphic that shows this, but you really have to be thinking about, okay, on top of the iceberg, you're seeing the kid refuse to do the schoolwork, but what's going on beneath there? 
clearly there's emotional overwhelm, even though they may not have the words to say that. They may have a history of having negative experiences associated with school that may be underneath the iceberg. They may not know where to start. They may feel unsuccessful. They may feel unengaged by the content. They may feel like the work that they're being asked to do within the content is meaningless in, in uh, relation to their life. They, so they're not finding purpose or meaning or any reason to learn the thing that they're being asked to learn. Often they're not being asked to learn, they're being asked to do. So it's to do a worksheet rather than to learn a concept, which to them, you know, their resistance is just trying to help them prevent them from doing something that seems meaningless. So we have to look at what, and then there may be attentional issues, there may be undiagnosed things going on, there may be emotional issues, there may be um, past trauma issues, current trauma issues. Um, so you, you got to figure out what what is this all about? And I think the hardest thing about this is how long it takes. Because if you're at this point where there's flat out refusal, you've got to back up a thousand steps and be like, we got to start here. We got to start with the, what I said before, the relationship, the connection, the child feeling heard, the child feeling seen, the child feeling emotionally safe, the child feeling like you understand them, like you're making an effort, even though you know you're trying to understand them, even though you know you're trying to hear them, even though you try so hard, it's how do they feel? And so when I'm working with a kid who's resistant, um, I'm starting with the relationship. I mean, I am starting at such a, uh, one metaphor I use sometimes is if we're trying to get a kid to write a paper and we say, hey, can you write this paper? And they say, no, okay, can you write a page? No, okay, can you write a paragraph? No, okay, can you write a sentence? No, okay, can you write a word? No, okay, can you write a letter? No, okay, can you make a dot? And I, I know that that was a really long explanation, but sometimes you, if you're in that sort of situation where there's that much resistance, you really have to consider as a parent how far back you're going to have to go to start moving forward because it's pretty far. You've got a, a lot to consider before you can get some traction. Now, having said that, we can get traction. You'll get there in a couple weeks or a couple months or a couple years or whatever, but it takes a long time. And one practical thing I will say about that, parents, is, look, if you can get someone who's not you in there, do it. And that helps. If you can get a mentor, a cousin, an, a relative, a friend of the family, somebody that your kid likes, if your kid is just shut down with you and you're not going to get traction for a long time, it, then find out, you know, it could be a therapist, it could be a tutor, it could be a teacher, but it, you, it may have to not be you. And I, I cannot emphasize enough. Again, I understand it's painfully long for some of you. I mean, I've had, I've had families where kids wouldn't go to school for so long that they're dealing with legal ramifications with the school district and and they can't even get their kid to step out the door because there's so much uh, anxiety or dysregulation or whatever is going on but those are very serious so it depends on the severity of your problem but it always is going to start with a relationship mm -hmm. yes it's great and i i'll just say that i interviewed for the podcast dr chris kearney he he actually has a school refusal center. Um, I think he's at the University of Nevada. I'm getting that wrong. Anyway, it comes out in two weeks. It was an incredible conversation. And I think he would, he would echo much of what you're saying now. And I think um, it is, he, he talked a lot about the underlying anxiety that is behind all of this, right? That for most kids who are in school refusal mode, it's because of underlying anxiety that they're experiencing. And I guess what I want to just reiterate, and I just say this over and over again uh, to parents, but to, and Seth, you can push back, but I really, the grades for me, like this isn't about grades right now. Our kids everyone's going to be falling behind. It's not just our kids. Like things are going to have to change because we can't just jump back in as if it's business as usual. This has been hugely disruptive for everyone, but our, 
I think when I hear from parents who are so stressed about homework, getting turned in late, not happening, grades falling, and we're seeing it already, um, that creates so much anxiety for us as parents. We start nagging, we're hurting our relationship with our kids, and they're going to resist more. And it's just this really negative cycle that we're going to be spinning down. And so prioritizing, as Seth said, that mm -hmm. Um, doing what we can to get our child out of fight or flight mode to calm down their anxiety to to ease back and, and if that means communicating with teachers in some cases and saying this actually is not going to happen right now or my child won't be doing x y and z like I'm okay doing those things because we are in unusual times and we have to prioritize our kids mental health right now and and that can be really hard. And I know I talked about this on another Facebook Live. The stakes seem really high, especially the older our kids are. And we feel that these grades are going to, you know, determine their future, right? We get this kind of mindset, but we really need to do the work on ourselves so that we're not bringing that energy into how we're trying to support our child because we're not going to make any progress if that's what we're kind of leading with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I hear, you know, the resistance from some parents is it comes in this type of a sentence that I hear a lot. If you would just do X, Y, and Z, it would be so much easier. It's not as bad as you think. If you would just get it done, you would feel such a sense of relief, blah, blah. So there's sort of that story because the parents can see the matrix and how simple the task is and how manageable it is, but the kid can't. So. I am someone who feels that grades are morally wrong. Morally wrong is the verbiage I use. I don't talk about this on my blog, but I think that they are morally wrong. Now about the story and the narrative. Grades are a story. They are a narrative we've had for about 150, 175 years. Humans have been using these things called grades, and we've created a story that is very un largely unconscious. And the story goes like this. If my kid gets certain grades, they're going to have certain opportunities, and they're going to have a certain life, and I want them to have a certain life. I want them to have a good life. And if they don't, then they aren't going to have the opportunities, and they aren't going to have it. So that's the whole narrative. Now, the question then becomes, is that narrative true? And if so, how true is that narrative? Now, if you're coming from where I'm coming from, where I think grades are morally wrong, I think it is uh, absurd that we have a metric called F that means failure. If kids are failing in school, that really means that the system or the education or that we adults have failed the kid. It does not mean that the kid has failed. Now, within the context of what is going on in school, they may have failed. But what does that mean? That means that they did not jump through the hoops that they were, they failed to jump through the hoops that they were asked to jump through in the way that they were asked to jump through them. And these hoops are arbitrary. They change from teacher to teacher, school to school. Um, it, it, so anyhow, but then we have the argument from the parent or the adult that says, well, then how, well, then if we don't use grades, how are we going to evaluate learning? And that, that is the question there. Great question. How can we evaluate learning? That's a much different question. And there are many, many ways to evaluate learning. Debbie and I are not going to test you after this call is over and see what you retained. And, you know, if you can do our multiple choice test or our essay or whatever. Uh, we're, in fact, we're not going to test you at all. You, you are going to see what you've learned or what you've gotten from this based on you know, your own self-evaluation and how you implement what you've learned. And you know, Likewise, you're not going to grade Debbie and I and give us a letter to evaluate how this was for you. So, and if we did, some of you would give us an A and some of you would give us an F. And you would probably all have what you believe were valid stories or narratives or reasons for those things. So um, yeah, I really think that's a good point. We're going to get very, now that does, uh, the other thing to consider is that grades are a necessary evil, meaning they're not necessarily necessary, but they do exist. And we do not want our kids 
to just be failing these classes and have to deal with the repercussions of that, you know, but <laughs> I hope that I don't, I, I hope I didn't go too far down the rabbit hole without there are two to that answer because <laughs> I, that is the rub, right? That is the catch 22 because everything you're saying and I'm reading the comments <sighs> resonates that we feel we all agree. So how do we, um, especially let's just put it in the context of what we're experiencing right now, because obviously this is the ongoing conversation about education, but within the context of right now, how can we kind of find more peace with being okay with what is happening with our kids' grades and your, if, if our kids are not, are, are struggling and we're noticing things are changing in your opinion? I, I, I don't have good answers for this because it's going to be messy. I mean, I don't want any kids to fail classes because then they're going to have to deal with retakes. They will have to deal with transcripts. If they want to go to college, they're going to have to deal with how that looks on. The so um, I made a, a video today where I'm talking to teachers about how to creatively assess. Um, and I'm doing all I can to help teachers figure out because teachers are not empowered to do creative assessment. And, but I mean, I, I don't know that I have good answers. I think that in a practical sense, so forget all, everything I said about morals and all that, but in a practical sense, you have to pick your battles. And that's where this is gonna, you know, if you have a kid who has to write a paper and your child's ability to convey ideas verbally is phenomenal and their ability to write that paper would take them so many hours that it's just not even funny um then you scaffolding and really helping them a lot with writing that paper and helping them get their ideas out to me is not cheating that is perfectly appropriate however are you going to tell the teacher how much well it depends how supportive that teacher is if the teacher is an awesome human being really gets neurodiversity really gets your kid then yeah you can talk to if your teacher is not that type of teacher and they don't get it and they don't get your kid and they never will and you know that in the depths of your soul then you don't tell the teacher how much you scaffolded for that kid. And you help your kid get as much out of that educational experience with developing your other ideas as possible while retaining your relationship and while retaining their mental health. So I, I hope that that's... <sighs> Sarah says truth. Teachers <laughs> need to be empowered to assess creatively. As a teacher, I know it's true. And I trained teachers to be creative. Um, I want to point out Darla uh, shared in the comments, maybe this is what we needed to swing the education pendulum in a different direction. I, you and I were just talking about that before, before the call. Right before we started recording. I couldn't agree more because again, every this is the, the sad truth is that everyone's going through this, right? And so now that it's everyone's problem, that uh, makes it a little easier for systems to change, right? Because it affects more people and it affects um, NTs. It affects, you know, the people with more power in this equation potentially. So um, I hope that that is the case. Um, systems do not want people who rock the boat. So the educational system does not want teachers as a whole does not want teachers to be creative and empowered. They, there are, there are massive corporations, textbook testing companies, uh, curriculum manufacturers that are profiting from the system being exactly how it is. So reformers, while there are amazing, many pe disruptive reformers, people who have amazing creative ideas, they don't rock the boat. They're just so small, it doesn't do anything unfortunately then they can't get traction and and ultimately in my view the kids end up being the ones who pay the price um but this is a very good time everything is going to be shook up the glass of mud in education is going to be so shook up and it's an opportunity for real innovation and real new cool ways and teaching isn't rocket science. It, it, it means that you have a human being who cares about your kid, who gets to know them, and who helps them learn good stuff for their life. But we have, we have turned this into a data 
system that is looking at that is missing the human beings and i think this is an opportunity for us to really 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 look at new ways of of doing things i love what taryn just wrote we just need to rock the boat without falling out love yes that. <laughs> <laughs> that's great um yeah so many good things um i i also just wanted to point out with someone i don't remember who it was in the comments made uh, a note that our kids don't shift gears easily, these kids in particular. And I think that is just, you know, I, I've been talking a lot about this in, in my podcast and in my Facebook lives, but it is just also a good reminder that yes, our kids are the ones who struggle the most with transitions. And this is the biggest, most unexpected transition that has probably ever happened to them. And so it is going to take a while to adjust. Um, with any kind of transition, there's going to be, we might be seeing regressions, we might be seeing, you know, increased resistance, increased intensity, increased emotional dysregulation, and just knowing that that is actually normal within the context. And so again, going back to that, not pushing right now, um, I think, you know, and we can talk about this, maybe we're, and I want to also be mindful of the time, but um, I'm good. I know people out there may not be, but We'll stay on for you guys for a while. But, you know, there is this kind of what's happening now. Like, I feel like now we're in triage in some ways, right? Yeah. This new, we're trying to figure it out. We're dealing with our own issues, which a parent had bro brought up a lot earlier. Like, how do we manage our own energy and anxiety right now? Because we're all going through this. Um, so we're in this kind of adjustment period. And depending on what happens... Um, we may need to pivot a little bit, right? We might be looking at more of a longer term, you know, if we know that we're, our kids are going to be out for the rest of the year, which I know many schools are saying that at this point, um, you know, we'll have to jump on and do this again and just kind of see where, where people are. But especially in these early days of this, um, that backing off and creating that safe space and having those conversations with our kids really, and I think it depends on how old your kids are, like how far you want to do this, but just being really transparent. This is what's happening right now. Um, these are the expectations um, in terms of school. And I care about our relationship too much for me to hurt it by being the nag, the reminder, the timer, the, you know, the homework police. Um, which I know some of our parents are, feel like they're playing that role and that can be really harmful for our relationship. And talking with our kids, like, how can I support you? What would be most helpful for you? Would it be helpful if I set backup timers? Would it be helpful if I set aside an hour tonight where we can just work side by side while you work on your homework and I'll do something else on my computer. What what do you think would, would be helpful? So trying to also bring them in and being realistic, like your grades may fall. Um, and are you okay with that? What are your goals for getting through this time? What would you like to see by the end of the school year in terms of you know what you've accomplished or how important is this to you? So like having that kind of real honest conversation so our kids are aware of. Again, I think it's age dependent on how far down that road you go, but just so they're kind of can feel a sense of ownership about the choices that are made and can express what kind of support they would be most helpful to them. Yeah, and I think that that's really important. I made a video about ownership recently and I got some comments on it where they're like, well, how do we get this ownership? How do we get this buy-in? So I talk about buy-in and ownership a lot. And what you're doing, Debbie, with the way you're phrasing the questions that parents can take away with this is you're asking, how do you, how do you, how do you? You're asking them, you're asking and asking. And what I would caution parents who are asking those sorts of questions, what I would caution you to do is really, really, really resist the temptation to respond right away. Because so often what parents will do is they'll say, well, what do you want in this? How would you blah, blah, blah. And, and you may have a kid that says, well, I, I would just want to have free time. And then the response 
the instant response from the parent might be something like, well, that's not going to work. Well, how's it, you know, and trying to use logic and reason and rationalizing with the kid. And well, I'm going to caution you to not rescue and save at those moments with these conversations. Your kid is testing you and they want to know that you're really listening. And when you respond suddenly to that thing, even though you're trying to use logic in the conversation, their nervous system is saying, yeah, they really didn't even hear what the heck I'm even talking about. <laughs> They're not talking about video games, even though they say I want to play video games all day long. So I'd really caution you to really practice and use this time when your child responds to you to not respond right back to them, but to say, wow, tell me more. Tell me more. Interesting. I want to hear more about what you think about that. Mm -hmm. And if your child is an introvert, um, it may take a lot longer than you think to get responses. You may have to do things like say, hey, I'm going to come back and ask you about it later tonight. And you may have to bite your tongue for 10 minutes and be like, tell me more. Tell me more. I'm listening. I'm really listening. And if your pattern in your family and you've grown up with family dysfunction from your parents and you never felt heard, it may be so tempting for you to respond in your habituated ways. And I just want to challenge you to really use this time to ask the questions. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? To ask the questions, but also to hold the space for the answer and to do it many, 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 many times over. Don't expect it's going to happen tonight. Meaning, would, would you... Uh, agree with that sort of line of reasoning, Debbie? Yeah, 100%, 100%. Um, I, I wanna jump in here. Um, someone posted, Kim posted, anyone else dealing with a senior who doesn't really have any incentive to do much schoolwork with graduation on the horizon? I just wanna um, say that I really feel for seniors right now. I mean, I feel for all our kids, but seniors, I know I've heard from so many parents whose graduations have been, or prom and just like all these kind of rites of passage that they've been waiting for are probably not happening. And that has gotta be really devastating um, right now. So, I mean, I would just start with an incredible amount of empathy and um, think about yourself. <laughs> I think a lot about how I would have handled this if I were in high school. It would not have been good. Because um, I was in, I was like, my, the, oh my God, if the spring concert and the musical had been canceled, I would have been devastated in my track season. Like it would have just crushed me. So trying to tap into ourselves, uh, our younger selves and, and thinking about how, and really empathizing with where our kids are right now. Um, but then I think it's, um, Okay, uh, sorry, there's a lot of people talking about this. Uh, yeah, we can't, no one can do college visits. I did just hear that a lot of colleges are doing the virtual tours. I just wanna throw that out there. The guidance counselor at Ash's school just said that um, for students who couldn't go to their tours, like actual live virtual tours, virtual conversations with guidance counselors at universities. So that they're, they're, they are trying to get creative about how those college visits can happen virtually. But I think, you know, Seth, I want to hear what you have to say, but my kind of gut reaction would be to, to kind of really sit down with your senior and look at what actually needs to happen. Like, are there some things that absolutely 100% have to happen um, between now and, and graduation and then working together to come up with a plan to, to get those done uh, and, and thinking about are there things we can let go or just be okay with not happening uh, right now? And what is actually the, the real life consequence if X, Y, or Z doesn't happen right now? Yeah. So one of the things I talk about in what I would consider more ideal schools is if we taught kids to be sort of their own project managers and creating meaningful project-based learning and going to college, the college uh, entrance process is a project with a lot of tasks that requires a lot of executive function to do that project. And on the practical side of that, I'd really recommend having calendars and Google Keep or Google Docs or ways to track or Asana or some sort of project management software or way to manage the project. 
uh, sticky notes, note cards, I don't care what it is, but some visual ways to really manage the mass of micro projects that need to happen to make the project happen. So it's an opportunity to use executive function to accomplish this project of getting into the college. So I wanted to mention that. Um, and then like you started with, with the empathy, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a lot of uh, emails from parents of seniors. So the empathy of, yeah, this is, wow, this, I, I really want to understand what your experience is with this. And then the other side of it, where I'm hearing a lot of parents say, my kid won't do anything. And I guess you have some questions to ask at that point. First of all, is it reasonable? You know, if they have senioritis and they're, they're going to be okay and they're going to get into the college, is it okay for them to chill for, for a minute? Uh, but then you have the other side of it. Are they not even ready for college? Because they, there's been a lot of hand handing, uh, hand holding, a lot of learned helplessness. They got accepted, but they're really independently, even now, not able to do. So that you really have to look at those things um, realistically and have the dialogue. But I think the again, the temptation. This is from what Debbie and I were talking about earlier. The temptation with these conversations is for the parent to feel the anxiety and say, if you don't get this done there, you're not going to get in. If you don't get this thing sent in, if you don't, you know, um, and we take on the anxiety and the executive function and they're not. And at that point, you really have to check yourself and say, what, what are we doing here? And have that conversation with your kid. You know, are you, do you want this? Are you ready for this? Are you sure this is, and I think that's really hard for parents to digest when they've had an expectation for the last 18 years that their kid's going to go to college at this time. They may not be ready. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just listen to that, guys. Breathe it in. Like that, it is okay. Like it, and I know this is where kind of the rubber meets the road for so many of us. And there are so many expectations about what's going to happen next. And you know, everyone's journey looks different. And, you know, as Seth shares his personal story, he, he had a very kind of, uh, you know, stops and starts story to get to, to where he is today. And that's all part of his journey. Um, and we are, are, some of our kids need extra time and that's okay. It's not the end of the world. And I actually just heard from a friend um, whose, whose child took a gap year um, and is a twice exceptional kid, um, EF challenges, took a gap year, uh, went to school. It seemed like it was a great fit. Um, and then decided halfway through the year, you know what, I'm not ready for this and came home and that's okay. And it's doing so good at home right now. And that's exactly what their journey needs to be like right now. So, um, again, the relationship, if your relationship with your kid is such that your kid could come home in that circumstance and be welcomed home and you want them to find their path and to, find, and to live a, life, a purposeful life and a, a, have a career of meaning. And, and, and like Debbie was saying, like for me, I failed out of college. I went to another college and dropped out. Uh, before I failed out. And then I took, I don't know how many gap years before I went back. You know, and I am living on purpose. I, I am a man with a good life, uh, with good relationships, with a good career, and I'm engaged in my life. And that's what I would hope for any of my kids, my students. They're your kids. While um, you're jotting down a note, there was something I wanted, well, I can mention it later. I wanted to touch upon this. This is a question that just came up. Kimberly posted it. Um, she said, how do you get kids to understand they need some sort of strategy to keep themselves organized? My daughter just doesn't think she needs strategies. And this actually is a, note, uh, a question that had come up before um, that a lot of these kids resist this idea or they see this as extra homework or they, they feel like their system is fine, even if we know they don't actually have a system. Um, and there was a bunch of people talking about like my child uh, refuses to use calendars. And, you know, so, um, you know, I, I'll just say for, for me, and I want to hear your expertise uh, here, but um, 
I try to be really patient with this stuff too. And let, um, I think it's important to let our kids fall on their faces a little bit. Um, and, uh, which can, it can take a while, <laughs> but, but really wanting them to become, to finally have something that's important enough for them, um, that they're going to recognize, okay, what I've been doing isn't working and I, and I need a strategy here. And that to get to that point could take a really long time. So sometimes as Seth always talks about zooming out and looking at the long game. Um, so that's my kind of instinctual uh, response to that question um, is to give you, you know, is to, or if your child is struggling or misses something and is upset about it next time you're there in that situation saying, Hey, let me know if you'd like some help. I, and I would be happy to brainstorm some strategies with you, but offering the help, not saying, here's what you should do. Um, and they may say, no, I've got it. And then they may go through that 10 more times until they're finally like, okay, I need a system. But what's your answer to that question? Oh my gosh. That we could talk about that for hours. What you just said has so many great nuggets in it. I mean, to let them fall on their face? Yes, absolutely. But we have to think about it in terms of, of what's going on with the particular situation. So, you know, if, if, if you say something like, it, you know, um, yeah, we're going to go do this thing with your friends. I'll put it in the calendar so that, you know, it's in the calendar and they're like, okay. And then they never check, but you know that that's a safe place for them to fall on their face because they didn't get to do something with their friends. That's great. But if you say, yeah, I'll remind you, I'll put it in the calendar and it's something, and then they fail a class. And then you're the one who has to be taking them to summer school every day. And they, you know, so, so we can construct experiences, um, and this sounds so manipulative, but it's not, but we can really, we can really mindfully construct certain experiences where we say, okay, kiddo, fine, you got it. I'm going to tell you this once, blah, blah, blah. It's on the family calendar. And you know that they're going to forget, but it's a low stakes thing. Well, then that, that is a good experience if they are able to connect the dots and reflect later. If they never learn from the thing, then that's one thing. Now, the again, the temptation, as I said earlier, for adults often is to really, you'd be like, I told you so, rub their face in it, uh, lecture, nag, you know, and that that's not um, going to get the desired result. But to say, wow, you missed that. What could you have done differently? You know, and to help them, start to reflect it's the way that we try to get them to reflect that is often not doing what we are hoping it will do um so and then again getting the buy-in and ownership you know the the kid says i don't need it i mean in this case the one that you were just reading debbie i mean the thing that i was imagining what that kid and parent what that interaction would be like and again the temptation for the parent would be to use logic and reason and try to help the kids see the light and say, no, you actually do because blah, let me tell you all the ways. Well, your kid already knows exactly what you're gonna say. And I don't know who wrote that or you know, if that's the case in that household, but it's very common for that to happen. And the kid, in, in that case, the kid is not even hearing you. So the attachment, this, the, what we were talking about before, the relationship isn't even, the, the, you're not even hearing each other. Part of healthy and secure attachment is that you both feel heard. Of course, that's a, it's a long journey. But in this case, my question would be, at that moment, when your kid says, I don't need this, is your response one that makes them feel heard or one that's telling them the logic? And what you want to do is really be like, oh, you don't. Tell me about that. How do you do that? Well, what are your ideas? How do you manage that stuff? How do you remember that stuff? Oh, really? And in your mind, you might be going, kiddo, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're so unrealistic about this, blah, blah, blah. But don't say that. You know, be like, oh, interesting. Cool. You might say, do you want to hear what I think? And then if they say yes, <laughs> then you tell them. Mm -hmm. um, but really look at the, does the kid feel heard? And then, you know, when I'm working with kids like that, again, I'm the coach, I'm not the parent. So this is a really good time to go to other people other than yourself. Mm -hmm. If you know your kid's not going to listen to your advice on planners and planning and calendars and stuff like that, if you know that they're not even going to listen to you until they're 23 years old uh, on that type of a topic, go to other people. 
go to relatives, friends of the family, mentors, kids who they look up to, um, go, go to those people. Don't, don't try to convince your kid. And then when those people are working with your kid, you know, sometimes you have epiphanies and you have a big change. That's not what we're banking on. What we're banking on is baby steps. That's what we're really looking for. If you can get that person to say, hey, why don't I, why don't you text me reminders and we'll do accountability for a week? Like that might be just a, a good way to like get a little bit of traction. And, you know, there, there's way, what we're looking for is these baby steps. Like, can we put a calendar on the wall? Can we use some sticky notes? You know, it might be really, seem really small at the time, but you got to start planting little seeds. And let me add on to that because I you shared so many great things there. The language that I use is, and I, I got this from someone, it might have been Bill Sixrood and Ned Johnson and um, the self-driven title, but would you be willing to try? So would you be willing to try a sticky note? Would you be willing to try this online calendar for a day and see what you think? Would you be willing to try? Yeah, so that that question is a real game changer. Um, there's also a script it that- It has to be low stakes. It has to be yes. very digestible for yes. the kid. Would you be willing to try? Or, and, and, and yes, low stakes, even the way you deliver it, right? Would you be willing to try this, right? Um, the, the script also from the self-driven child, um, which, which we can use I, definitely with older kids, I trust you to make your own decisions and to learn from your mistakes. And that giving our kids that sense of control, it shifts everything. Um, it really changes and it feels really good to say as a parent, like it feels for me <laughs> to say that. It's like, I trust you to make your own decisions and to learn, you don't know, have to say it flippantly or sarcastically, don't do that. But, um, but I think that that can be really helpful. Um, and you know what my grandma used to say to me? That yeah. would always get me. She, I, I, uh, I was not a model child or teenager. <laughs> Let me put it that way. And she would say, I know you'll do the right thing. And I would be like, oh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> really <laughs> that's, so funny. that's awesome i never yeah. do the right thing okay yeah. but it was so. very empowering yeah, yeah. i sure. remember that to this day for sure but that was yeah. that was the buy-in like she was like mm -hmm. i it was saying i trust you I, I i know you can handle this yeah and that just especially for an, a, a teenager um is everything and it really does end that power struggle um what i do a lot of now is offer like like, I'm actually, this is something I'm actually really good at. So if at any point you would like me to sit down with you and talk about this project, I'm happy to help you structure it. Just let me know. I'm available between like for a couple hours before dinner. And then after seven, I won't be free anymore. But if you want help with that, let me know. But it's fine if you don't. Like I do it very kind of. I do that same sort of thing. And if I know that they don't have, they're not realistic and they're not going to come, then I'm going to say, do you want I'm going to say, do you want me to come back? So I work with a group of kids in the office. Um, so, and they'll be there for maybe three hours on a given night. And I'll say, do you want me to come back in 15 minutes and check on you? But I want that buy-in where they say yes. And then if they say yes, I say, what do you want me to ask you? So I, I cannot emphasize to parents how much backstepping this is. Like a lot of what Debbie and I are doing is we're we're just going so far back and then we can start moving forward. But you as the parents often can feel this anxiety of they need to get it done now. I know they just sat down for 15 minutes to be, oh, you know, but it, you got often have to really step back because it's the long game. I want buy-in. I want them to feel like they made the choice. And, and to say, to just say what we need to do in order to be able to do what Seth just summarized is we have to do the work on ourselves. Like we just have to, because if we don't, we are going to show up with that energy that is attached to the outcome for all of this. And then it doesn't matter what we say. Uh, our kids aren't going to believe it. And when Debbie says the energy, what she means is, is that your nervous system is speaking louder than your words. Yes. They feel 100%. it. Yes. And so it's so important 
that we, and this is so much of what I do in, within TILT Parenting, that we constantly learn about ourselves, that we understand our own triggers surrounding these things, our own triggers around fear of failure, around what it would mean if our child's future didn't look a certain way, um, around what it means, you know, that our family is struggling in certain areas. We need to do that work on ourselves and kind of understand where that's coming from, work on those beliefs. Uh, we talked in the very beginning about beliefs and thoughts and emotions, you know, question those beliefs that we have that are controlling our anxiety, that are feeding our fear, that are kind of adding to this stress um, and overwhelm that we feel when we're talking about these issues. And if we can kind of do that work on ourselves, then we, when we show up to support our kids and coach them and be this, this person that they need more than ever during these times while we're in close quarters, when we can do that work and we can show up from such a better place and we are going to have better results, our family is going to work better and the dynamic is going to feel much healthier. And we are modeling uh, personal development, even if we don't even say a word about it. We are modeling that and their nervous systems feel, oh, my yeah. parent is uh, working on themselves. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do as I become an adult. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about it too. We can even not just model it silently. We can talk out loud about our own emotional uh, intelligence growth. <laughs> I think that's something so important too that I was thinking at the very beginning of our conversation is I talk about the messiness, but like, if you have a complete blow up with your child and you catch yourself or you catch yourself an hour later, you can be like, you know what? I noticed that when this happened, I felt this in my body. I felt all this tension. I was afraid that if this didn't happen, this would, yeah, we can really be vulnerable and honest and open and just be human, mm -hmm. so not have to look pretty. Yeah, no, and it's often very messy, but that's again, a good prep for life, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I want to kind of wrap this up. This has been, so, I feel I'm just scanning through the questions I had in advance. Still listening? What's that? Are people still listening? Yeah, we've got 70 people still live right now. Well, hello, humans. Um, yes, it's been, there's over 210 comments uh, on the thread. So it's been a very engaged audience. I loved reading through all these and I'll go back and read through them in more. Cool. I wish I could have seen it. <laughs> I'll look at it later. We'll go back later and watch. Um, but I just want to, first of all, thank you, Seth, for doing this. Um, this is so valuable. And I, I know that it's just calming for so many people to hear and just to get these reminders and even to take this time out of our crazy, um, strange schedules that we are all having right now to focus on ourselves and doing this work together. So, um, Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to, want to allow for a final question. Is there anybody that really has a pretty, they're really in a rough place and they want to ask a quick question? We can do that. I would like to offer that. If anybody's really suffering out there and really just really wants to ask something, just take a minute and ask it and we'll, we'll do one more question. Terry wants us to partner in writing a curriculum book. Just gonna say, we're getting a lot of lovely thank yous and um, people are, are very happy we did this. And thank, thanks to all of you guys for showing up because um, this is great. Can I mention something about curriculum then? Bring it on. All right, here's the deal parents. You're gonna have schools saying you need to jump through these hoops and you as the parent are gonna have to determine is this a valuable use of my child's time and energy of our family's time and energy? How much energy do we wanna put the, into this? Because you know that your kid has to have important educational experiences for their life. And if you're looking at it and it's busy work and it's like, you're like not feeling it, can they just get it done and in? 
And, and then if, if that's the case, then what do you as the parent want to do? And what I want to inspire you with right this second is this in terms of curriculum. Forget the word curriculum. What I want you to be thinking is educational experience or experiences. In the gifted and talented world, they use the term enrichment. So they have a lot of, you can look up gifted and enrichment. But the point is, is look, I had a kid the other day who works at a hardware store in town. And he said, oh, the hardware store gave me this humidifier and I'm gonna figure it out tonight. In my mind, I'm thinking, and that was because it was returned and they couldn't put it back on the shelf. But in my mind, I'm thinking that is a good ex educational experience. The kid's gonna be reading directions, learning about humidifiers. Who the heck would think that that's an educational experience? But I know as an educator, who all I care about is education, that that is a phenomenal educational experience. I don't care about a test. His assessment is, does the humidifier work? But he will be reading directions, putting something together, learning about a whole new thing, learning about a machine. But there's so much learning. There's practice in reading, practice in communicating about it. There's so much learning that can go on with something like that. So when you're thinking about your child's ed education and you're worried about their future, think educational experiences. What experiences are they having that are is going to plant seeds for them to have a good life. If you are ordering from Grubhub, which is the thing we have here in the States where you can order food online and you have your kid do the order and your kid calculate the tip and your kid calculate the tax, that's an educational experience. They will have to be able to calculate tax when they're older. We don't often teach that in school. So anyhow, the point is, is Think outside the box, think educational experiences, think what sorts of experiences can we have? And the final thing I wanna tie that together with is there is a term called unschooling. So there's homeschooling, but there are also families who do something called unschooling. Unschooling is very um, uh, experiential <coughs> education, but I just want you to really understand that you, you, you obviously don't want your kid playing video games all day long. I would not argue that that is a good use of educational experiences, although your kid can argue that there are valuable things from their shirt, sure, whatever. I'm, I want your kid to have, play an instrument, write a book, do art. Anyhow, that's what I wanted to leave you with. Thank you for that. So a couple things, uh, and we do have a last question before the last question is going to be about gaming and video games because that's what everyone just shared. But before we get to that, I want to reiterate a few things. Number one, I love what you said about educational experience. And I just wanted to say a really great resource for unschooling and this mindset of learning through experience and uh, finding uh, the learning and experiences is Blake Bowles. I like Blake too. Uh, yep. he, I've had him on my podcast. He's fantastic. Uh, and so if you just, it's B-O-L-E-S, I'll include the links later. Um, but Blake Bowles, yep. I want to reiterate where you guys can connect with Seth and both Seth and myself. Seth's website is Seth curler.com. Again, I will recap and put a separate post in here with the links we talked about, but sethperler.com, sign up for his newsletter list. My executivefunctionsummit.com. Okay, executivefunctionsummit.com. Um, my website is tiltparenting.com. Again, sign up for there for all kinds of resources and to make sure you know when my podcasts come out. Um, and please share our stuff. Yeah. So if this is helpful to you, share it like crazy. Share our sites with people. That helps us. It does. It helps us. Um, I may be doing another Facebook Live. I saw that Dana Abraham was on here earlier oh. in this call. Oh, cool. um, I'm going to check in with her. I may be doing a Facebook Live with her here tomorrow about her calm, um, calm the chaos program, which is really helpful right now if you're feeling like your life is chaotic. So um, so there's that. Now, the last question. Uh, yes, Emily said Blake Bowles. That's the correct spelling, B-O-L-E-S. Um, everyone just jumped on. It was like video games, video games. My kids on video games all the time right now. And that's often where social connection is happening. Um, and how do we balance that right now? So I'm going to say something and then I'm going to let you go. What, I, what I'm going to say is that for those of you who have really strict screen time limits, my thinking is this, isn't, this is not the time to, to be um, trying to maintain those exact same limits if it's creating a lot of tension in your family. So I do recommend a little bit of a loosening right now, if that's possible. I know that 
a lot of gaming can really dysregulate some kids. So um, figuring out a way to collaborate together. But um, again, unusual times call for unusual um, approaches to how we spend our days. So for me, I'm like guidelines. Um, my, our guidelines include things like making sure we get exercise every day, no matter what, um, making sure that there is time spent playing piano or, you know, doing something separate. We have a puzzle set up on the table. So just taking a puzzle break, um, making sure that uh, dinner is screened. Like we have certain guidelines that, uh, but a guideline feels less uh, constricting than um, strict than a rule. So what do you, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, this is one of the hardest um, things for me to talk about, Debbie, because I don't have great answers. I have, I will tell you that with the story and the narrative that every family has a different story and a narrative and that I have families where I have parents say, oh no, my kid would never use gaming during dinner. They're up there, blah, blah, blah. And, and they have that sort of a boundary and that's just how the family culture has developed it. And I have parents that look at that parent and go, what? How did you do that? My kid will throw it against the wall and yell at me. So th there's this whole spectrum. So you really have to look for where you are. What I will say is what we said at the beginning is that creating a weekly structure. And again, I don't want kids, the frame is important. If you say we're gonna take away electronics rather than the frame is different if it's we're gonna give it. Or what Debbie was saying is we have time for exercise every day, for music every day, for art every day, for learning every day, for connection every day, for fun every day, for um, what I, and then for electronics every day, you know, uh, getting the buy-in and the ownership. Uh, oh, so anyhow, what I was saying is you creating a structure, a weekly structure where you have the important things, uh, then getting the buy-in and the ownership. How much time do you think you should have? How are you going to do these other things? And of course, you need to draw the line sometimes because they might say, oh, yeah, well, I, I can do this all the time. Um, and you got to figure out, you know, if I had my wish, I would say no kid would have electronics in their bedroom ever. So they wouldn't have a, and then they're gonna say, oh, well, I need my phone for my alarm clock. Uh, get a $5 alarm clock. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't want them charging their phones or their laptops or their devices in their bedroom. I want that to be a room for sleep and quiet and peace and reading and whatever. Um, but that uh, that isn't gonna happen with everybody. Um, so, you really got to pick your battles, but I think you try to get the buy-in and the ownership. You do structure now and uh, might sound contrary to what Debbie said, but I would caution you to have more structure now and loosen up later than less structure now and tighten up later. Um, but what Debbie said is completely valid too. At this time, there's a, a way with boundaries to be able to say to your child, hey, you know what, I'm going to give you a little bit more time on this. I know, I know things are different right now. And, um, but then you can get the buy-in and the ownership. But how do I know that you're going to be with us for dinner and I'm not going to be, you know, arguing with you at dinner time and, or whatever? You know your kid's script. I mean, you know exactly what they're going to say. So you want to think it through before they say it so that you can, you know, say, hey, you're probably going to say yada, yada, what, what do you want me to say when you say that? And yeah, <laughs> you like that one. Yes. No, I think that's that that collaborative problem solving, but doing that specifically, like, so how do you want me to respond if this happens? What should I say in this situation? And so having that conversation ahead of time with these kids really preps them. And so then when they hear it happening, they're already kind of halfway there. So I think that's great. And you know. If you haven't, you guys haven't had a family meeting yet, may, do so um, yeah. regularly. We're doing them once a week. Talk about, you know, screen time as part of that conversation and design a plan together. Let your kid have some ownership in it. Um, maybe uh, don't go into that with a really um, severe agenda of what you think it needs to look like and try to persuade your kid to get there. Have it be like a real collaboration and let your kid have some control over what it looks like. And then you can say, okay, let's try this. How long should we try it for? Let's try it for three days and check in and see how well it's working. Um, so you can be really also just experimental and curious in structuring that together. Um, but I think that those uh, 
I think that having that meeting and getting that constant collaboration is important. But Perry said, um, my kid would tell me exactly what he wants me to say. That's very funny. And Elizabeth, hey, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hamlet. Um, Elizabeth, will you share your website on here too? Because I don't want to get it wrong. Elizabeth is a work is actually for the seniors in the bunch. She's got fantastic resources on going from high school to college, especially for kids with learning differences. And she just shared a great resource for having a Sunday meeting. Thanks for sharing that. Wow, so, you could do a, a great senioritis uh, video or something. There's so much to do. <laughs> There's so many things and to Debbie do. Debbie and I are just like making so much content for families right now. It's a difficult time. It is a difficult time. Um, but you, you guys, do you agree with the unschooling thought too, with where parents can really just keep it simple? I, I 100% do. Um, I do. It's scary for a lot of parents, but uh, I think it, um, we all, at the end of the day, as you always say, Seth, we're zooming out and we are raising humans, right? We're raising adults that we want to know who they are when they're grown, we want them to understand their strengths. We want them to understand areas of weakness. We want them to know how to advocate for things. We just want them to understand how to move through the world so they can contribute, right? And um, I think unschooling can be a great way. And if you read uh, Blake Bull's things, listen to the podcast I did with him, he really explains um, why it can be so powerful because for a kid, we might spend three years trying to get them to understand, you know, how to plan one, how to organize a calendar, but all of a sudden they're motivated about something that they care about and they can learn it in a day. Yeah. So helping them tap into things that, that excite them. Um, and finding, as you said, the learning and everything, which is what I did when I homeschooled for six years. I really just built the learning around uh, my son's areas of interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm wrapping this up. You guys, we've gone for an hour and a half. Wow, thank you. We still have 60 people on. So thank you to all of you for being a part of this. This is feels just as a parent in the midst of this is, uh, helps me personally. Um, I know that Seth has been showing up big time for our families and for our kids. And I know that this is really uh, important for you to connect as well. So I just wanna thank you guys for thank being you. on the other end of this conversation. Seth, thank you again. Please go check out um, our websites. I will some point later today put together a thread where I recap some of the links that we talked about. And everyone, just sending lots of love to you all. Uh, and take well. a deep breath. I wanted to start this way, right? This second, everybody. <sighs> yeah. Do some belly breaths today. That Not chest breathing, but in your belly. Yes. Do it yes. with your child. We've got this. You guys, we've this all This will it. pass. Yes, it will indeed. All right, people. Um, great to see you all. Thanks again for being here. I'm going to try to gracefully end this recording. And um, Seth, thank you again. Thank you. All right.